38 on 44 kicks this year. Nice high kick, got a little wind under it. And it runs Howard back over. Look at that. Oh, my goodness. One man. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's me. And, and you're probably wondering how I ended up in this situation. We have to rewind the clock about 11 years from that day. I first started playing organized football at the age of 10 years old as a scrawny little kid in Cleveland, Ohio. Now on my team, we had a kid named Johnny. Johnny was a running back and he was exceptional. Really, really talented kid, one of the best on the team. But Johnny had one problem. He knew he was good. And because he knew he was good, he liked to do things his own way from time to time, which actually drove our head coach crazy. <laughs> so one day we were at practice, and our coach was trying to get Johnny to run a 22 blast. So in simple terms, he just needed to go up the middle. That was it. Go up the middle. Johnny would get the ball and then go to his right and turn it into a sweep. So finally, reluctantly, in practice, Johnny ran the play the right way, but with a slight attitude. A couple of days later, we had a game. Coach called the play, 22 blasts. Johnny took the handoff, took one step, then stepped with his left foot, planted it hard, and tried to get around the right side again. But he got caught and tackled into, in the backfield. Coach was hotter than fish grease. <laughs> I mean, he was living. He started waving for Johnny to come out the game, didn't say not one word to the boy, just pointed to the bench. That was it. Johnny was done for the day. Didn't play any more in that game. So a couple of days later, we were at practice, and Coach gathered us around. He said, listen, Johnny's not going to be on the team anymore. He explained to us that he had no problem coaching everybody, but he could not coach anyone who thought they believed they knew more than he did. That lesson stuck with me because it taught me that no matter how talented you are, if you're not coachable, you are replaceable. Now, being coachable, the importance of being coachable is something that I've always felt strongly about, always felt strongly about that. But what would you do to receive the best coaching? What would you do to receive the best training? What sacrifices would you make? I mean, because this doesn't have to be about sports. Let's just say you're a, a, a young violinist, and you had the opportunity to, to learn from a maestro. But it required you giving up your social life for a significant part of time. Would you do it? Or if you're a young person in the tech world trying to find your space, and you get wind that there's going to be one of the nation's leading engineers who's going to be a guest lecturer at a college campus that's about an hour and a half from you, would you take that trip that entire semester despite the inconvenience? I was raised in the inner city, and my brothers, my older brothers, my friends, and my teammates they all attended the public high schools in our neighborhoods. I chose a different path. I wanted to go to this school called St. Joe's High School, St. Joseph. It was way, way, way across town, way across town. I didn't know you can travel that far in that direction and still be in the state of Ohio. I had no idea. <laughs> I kid you not. But they had this coach a legendary high school football coach named Bill Gutbrod. Let me tell you a little bit about Bill Gutbrod. First, he was the only high school coach St. Joe's ever had up to that point. He had been there since 1950. Bill Gutbrod was a decorated World War II veteran who fought in the Battle of the Bulge. He was known to be a strict disciplinarian and really tough on his players. Yeah, I don't want to be coached by that guy. <laughs> I really do. 
I'm talking about it would, it would require me to get up at 5 a.m. to take a two-hour commute using three city buses just to get to school every morning. It would also mean that I would be removed from an environment where everyone looked like me to go to one where barely anyone looked like me. It meant that I would have to step out of my comfort zone, both mentally and physically. But you know what? I wanted to be coached by him. So once I got to St. Joe's, I quickly found out that Coach Gutbra has some very unique um, coaching methods. <laughs> I kid you not. So we would be at practice, full uniform, practicing for about an hour. Coach Gutbrod would walk up to a player, look at his uniform, a couple of grass stains on his uniform. He would say, where's the blood? Where's the blood? <laughs> Kid you not, it gets better. If you didn't have any blood on your uniform, the man will pull out a bottle of ketchup from his back pocket and squirt you. I can't. Shh, 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 shh. I kid you not. I can't make this stuff up, people. I really can't. But in Coach's mind, the way he was wired, that football was such a physical sport that either your blood or your opponent's blood should be on your uniform. Now, that was the 80s. <laughs> Couldn't get away with that stuff today. <laughs> but notwithstanding those tactics, Coach used to work us very hard. I mean, we would be in full pads three times a day. We would practice three times a day in full pads. In full pads, we would go run on the, 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 the sandy shores of Lake Erie. He drilled us like a military, like we were in the military, and he knew just how to get the best out of his team. He was a tremendous coach. He made us both physically and mentally tough. And he prepared me for this guy, <laughs> Bo Schimbeckler. <laughs> Despite growing up in the Buckeye State, the allure to be coached by one of the greatest in the game was just too strong for me to ignore. Bo Schembechler was my favorite coach on any level, and he was one of the greatest teachers that I ever had. So when people hear the word coach and coachable, oftentimes this image pops into their heads. But look beyond his whistle and my pads, and what you see is a master teacher and his pupil. Bo taught so many lessons, and he didn't, now he, he didn't walk around with ketchup in his back pocket. Now, he didn't do that. But he did carry a yardstick from time to time. <laughs> and if you messed up in practice, you would become acquainted with that yardstick. <laughs> but Bo taught us so many life lessons, big, small. Most of them I carry with me today. You know, Bo taught me how to make sure I paid attention to detail. No matter what you do, not just in football, no matter what you do in life, pay attention to detail. And then he was always talking about being punctual. Make sure you're on time. In Bo's world, early was on time, on time was late. And there was another thing that Bo was, um, was, was very proud of, and, and something that he instilled in his players. I don't know if you guys know this or not, but Bo, he actually promoted the value of mentorship. He actually dedicated a chapter in his book to it. In his book, Bo's Last Lessons, Bo's Lasting Lessons, chapter two is titled, Seek Mentors, Not Money. And that meant a lot to me. Because my time in Ann Arbor, it wasn't all smooth sailing. As a freshman, I had a position coach that we just kept butting heads. And the situation was about to erupt. I mean, I didn't know what to do. But fortunately for me, very fortunately for me, I had initiated a mentor-mentee relationship 
with a man in the athletic department named Greg Harden. Now, let me explain to you guys who Greg Harden was. Mr. Harden was the guy who student athletes were sent to when coaches didn't know what to do with them anymore. <laughs> okay. So, however I chose to handle my situation with the position coach, I understood that I was going to have to meet with Mr. Harden either, either voluntarily or involuntarily. But the meeting was inevitable. So I took it upon myself before things got out of hand to go to Greg's office. And I remember sitting in Greg's office and telling him my situation. And he's, mm-hmm, okay, yeah. yeah, that makes sense, yeah. And then when I was done, he actually brought me back to a lesson that I learned in peewee football. That no matter how talented you are, if you're not coachable, son, <laughs> you're replaceable. And I was like, mm. And then he hit me with some, I mean, he, he would. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> it gets worse. He, he said, quote, unquote, so what you were the guy in high school? Everybody here was the guy in high school. That doesn't, no, no one cares about that, son. He hit me with some harsh reality that straightened me out. And he helped me understand that, listen, put your ego to the side, humble yourself, and not only accept this criticism, but let the criticism fertilize your soul. Let it build you up. Use it as energy. And he also taught me to look at the big picture. Look at the big picture. Always seek knowledge from people who are the best in what they do. Always seek knowledge from people who are the best in their fields. So my sophomore year, during spring break, I got on the plane and went to Northern California. My oldest brother, Jonathan, was stationed at Travis Air Force Base out there. Now, most 19-year-old kids, boys at that time, especially in college, during spring break, they would take a trip to Cancun or someplace where they can chase girls. I was different. I was on a mission. Pre-Google Maps, <laughs> I was able to figure out that UC Berkeley was about an hour from where my brother lived. So this is what I did. I convinced one of his friends to drive me to UC Berkeley. And when I got there, I went to the sociology department. And I approached the woman at the front desk, and I said, excuse me, miss, um, could you please um, give me the office hours? of this particular professor, who I was there to see unbeknownst to him. <laughs> she gave me the office hours. I went to his office. He wasn't there. I sat on the floor for about an hour. It felt like three or four hours because I was so nervous. And at one point, I see the six foot eight, bald headed, full bearded, black man in his signature shades walking down the hallway. So I immediately I get up and I try to compose myself, but I'm still very, very nervous. And as he approached me, I stuck out my right hand and I met Dr. Harry Edwards. For those of you who don't know who Dr. Harry Edwards is, Doc Edwards um, is a world-renowned sports sociologist. He was the architect behind the protest in the 1968 Olympics with Tommy Smith and John Carlos. I explained to Doc Edwards that I was a student athlete from the University of Michigan, that I had seen him speak a few months prior on campus, and that I was on spring break, and I would greatly appreciate if he would just give me 10 minutes of his time. We went into his office, we sat down and spoke, had a very enlightening and illuminating conversation. When the discussion was over, I had just a new perspective on issues relating to sports and race, which was something that was part of my journey at that time. And before I left his office, he gave me his book, his autobiography, The Struggle That Must Be, and he signed it for me. And that one chance meeting 
with Dr. Harry Edwards actually turned into a mentorship that's invaluable to me to this day. Last year, when the uh, Fair Pay for Play Act was passed in California, and I was trying to do some research for my show, the first person I called was Dr. Harry Edwards. Because I knew that he had a hand in crafting the language and making sure that it passed. When I speak to Dr. Edwards, or I speak to Greg Harden, any of my mentors, I always find myself listening twice as much as I speak. I'm always present. I always want to be present and making sure that they get my undivided attention, which I believe is a problem because there are too many people seeking attention and can't pay attention. Chasing followers and chasing likes. It's like inhaling and trying to exhale at the same time. It's impossible. You can't do it. It just doesn't work. You need to slow down, be quiet, so then you can listen and you can observe and you can learn from the people around you. We have a, a society now that is, is just drowning in information but starving for wisdom. Now, I've shared with you some of my, my life lessons and how I pursued coaches even when the road wasn't easy and how I sought mentorship using some atypical methods. But it's really not complicated and it's not hard. And every single one of you, every person here, I don't care who you are, what you do for a living, or what you study. Every single one of you can you practice these until they become habits. You can use these so they can help you with any goals that you have in life. Be coachable. Don't be afraid to step out of your box. Make sure that you can make the sacrifices necessary to get the best training available to you and what you're trying to accomplish. When I say be coachable, huh, it's not just about sports. It's applicable to just about anything in life that involves teaching and learning. Be coachable. Seek mentorship. Don't be afraid to approach a person who may inspire you. Ask them a question. Ask them for advice. Don't be afraid of that. Because it's only when you decide that everyone who inspires you are out of reach, do they actually become out of reach. Let me tell you one thing that I started to do about eight years ago. When I'm in a room with someone who's highly accomplished and I want to have a conversation with them, feel free to use this too. <laughs> the first thing I do is I sit back a little bit and I observe them. And I look, see how they engage in small talk with people. But then I approach them. I say, um, excuse me, uh, Mr. Highly Accomplished Person. Um, <laughs> no, I don't say that. I say, excuse me, can I ask you a quick question? And I follow that with, would you please tell me or share with me your five keys to success? That's an instant icebreaker, a great icebreaker. And then you initiate a conversation with something of substance. You can walk away with that, with some very good information, and who knows, that conversation could turn into something like a mentor-mentee relationship. So don't forget, be coachable. Seek mentorship. One more time, be coachable. Seek mentorship, because that is how I ended up in this situation. Thank you very much. Thank you.